Good morning, everyone. Today I'm joined by John McNeil, a long serving member of our faculty, our university professor, and 2019 recipient of the President's Award for Distinguished Scholar Teachers. So John, thank you for taking the time to join us for this conversation. To begin, for those in our community who may not know of you and your work, you are an eminent scholar of environmental history. How would you describe the field of environmental history and why is it important? So, first of all, Jack, thanks for having me on this uh, series of conversations. The answer to that question, uh, when you and I were in school, there was no such thing as environmental history. It's among the innovations within the history discipline. And what it amounts to is the study of the ways that societies have interacted with the ecosystems on which they depend. And that can include a sort of uh, biogeophysical history, the history of, of forests and frogs and uh, that sort of thing. It can include a, an administrative and legal history, how societies have sought to regulate their relationship with uh, their environments. And it can include a cultural and intellectual history, how people have thought and written uh, or even danced uh, about the subject of uh, nature or the human relationship uh, with nature. And this is done by historians, but from slightly different angles, it's also done by people with training in ecology or geography or a handful of other disciplines. And within the history discipline, it's about oh, 50 years old now. Got it, got it. Now, how does your background as an environmental historian shape how you look at our current moment with the COVID-19 pandemic? What are some of the issues you're focused on in this moment? So I've been paying a lot of attention to the pandemic in the last uh, six months, um, including recording a, a journal of the plague year in imitation of uh, Daniel Defoe. The background that I have in environmental history probably disposes me to align myself with people who understand the pandemic in a grand ecological framework, by which I mean matters such as the encroachment of uh, human settlement on uh, forest ecosystems, raising the probability of interactions between humans and other species, which raises the probability of so-called zoonoses, the transfer of uh, microbes that are potential pathogens from animal populations to human populations, which is how we got SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is the large scale ecological framework in which I and many others tend to see the pandemic. But as a historian in general, I'm also very conscious of the role of continual um, growth of connections. You could call it globalization, but uh, it's probably more than is conventionally understood by that term globalization. A set of connections making the world a smaller place, raising the probability that an epidemic in one place becomes a pandemic. And there were real pandemics in the global sense until the 19th century. And now we see that because of air travel in particular, they are uh, easier to, uh, to get launched and more common as a result. Those are some of the ways in which my um, background uh, leads me to think about the pandemic. And, and how has the pandemic, how is it impacting your scholarship and your teaching? Well, it's impacting my teaching uh, in the way that it's impacting uh, a lot of people's teaching and everybody's at Georgetown. Sure. Which means I'm doing it uh, remotely. Um, I'm also doing more tutorials with students than I've ever done before. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure why, maybe because I feel guilty that we're not meeting uh, in person. Um, but it also has affected my teaching in that back in May, as the pandemic was getting more uh, serious uh, week after week, I started arguing that um, Georgetown and particularly the units that I'm associated with, such as the School of Foreign Service, need to begin new curricular initiatives that put the pandemic front and center. So this has evolved and I've been working with uh, other people, particularly Nicole Bivens Sadaka of the MSFS program. And we now have a, a course built around the pandemic and what it means and might mean for the future uh, for uh, students, graduate students throughout the School of Foreign Service. And helping to design that was one of my summer projects. It's underway, so far so good. Beautiful. And a, a handful of other people around the university are doing other things, much of which I didn't know about until uh, more recently. But I'm glad to see the responsiveness, not just uh, in the School of Foreign Service, but elsewhere, to the pandemic, because this is, as everybody can appreciate, a life-altering experience for us, particularly in the world of education. As regards my scholarship, uh, I'm probably not likely to try to write a history of the pandemic, although it has occurred to me that uh, one could. I'm sure journalists are, are working on it already. The way that it's affected my scholarship most conspicuously is that I can't go to libraries and archives because I can't travel and most of them are closed anyhow. So the kind of research that is basic to historians is unavailable to me and to all historians, almost all historians. I sh can make an exception for people who work with, uh, let's say, uh, intellectual history because their sources are usually published works. So I'm maneuvering, trying to find work that I want to do, that I can do in the current environment, because I do not imagine that we, we will be free to travel to libraries and archives um, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. if, if we are within 12 months, I'll be happy. You, this past year, you served as president of the American Historical Association. Can you talk, let's t talk a little bit about that role? Sure. Um, I am now a, a happy ex. <laughs> well, um, congratu congratulations. It's a great, great honor. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, the good news is there's virtually no fundraising involved in being president of that, as opposed to being president of what you're president of. It was uh, interesting. Um, some of the work was a bit on the uh, routine side, trying to figure out ways to sustain our membership. The most interesting aspect of it was probably the most depressing aspect of it, which was responding to situations in which historians around the world were uh, mistreated. So that can mean um, thrown into prison. There was a, a case that acquired some publicity concerning a PhD student at another university who was in prison in Tehran, accused of espionage, a frivolous accusation, I believe. And uh, he was eventually freed. Probably not because I wrote a letter of protest to the Ayatollah, but who knows? Um, I think the State Department might have had more uh, impact than I in this. But I dealt with probably 10 such situations in which uh, historians were unjustly treated. Sometimes it was uh, as serious as that. Sometimes it was somebody uh, losing a job or being denied access to uh, an archive. Um, but the serious ones were pretty serious. Yeah. pretty depressing, although I have to admit that this kind of hazard 
uh, befalls journalists a hundred times more often than it falls, befalls historians. Um, the other good thing about it is that um, because I was responsible for promoting the interests of 12,000 historians, I paid attention to a wider spectrum of the discipline than I am normally expected to, required to, or motivated to uh, attend to. And that was a bit of a late life uh, education for me and a good experience in that regard. Now, in January, you shared in your American Historical Association presidential address that you thought the discipline of history might be entering a new era, one in which written documents may matter less and evidence generated by the natural sciences may matter more. Can you share more about your thinking about this? What, what led you to make this case and why do you think this is important? Sure. Well, first, let me say I could be entirely wrong about this. This is a speculative argument that I made and um, it's published in the February 2020 issue of the American Historical Review for those who are <laughs> fascinated to pursue it in detail. Part of the reason I made this argument is because of directions in my teaching. So uh, last semester, the semester that was uh, broken in two by the uh, pandemic, I was together with some of my colleagues teaching a brand new course, introductory level course uh, in the history department about history beyond textual sources. So for example, what can genetics tell us about the past? What can linguistics tell us about the past? What are some of the new techniques in archeology span that can tell us about the past or techniques in paleoclimatology? So my colleagues and I were working through uh, all of this. And of course we had to plan this course prior to the beginning of the last semester. So that helped me to think about uh, how we gain access to the past. And of course, for the last 150 years, the standard procedure for historians has been to find some written documents, figure out what they say, analyze them, and write history on that basis. And that's fine, and historians will continue to do that. But increasingly, particularly for the parts of the world that are poorly served by documentary evidence, and that's a lot, uh, large parts of the world for large periods of time for which there's very little documentation or zero. We need other uh, avenues to reach the past. And in the last five, 10 years, uh, genetics or more properly speaking, paleogenomics has been the most uh, fruitful of these avenues, giving us insights into subjects such as human migration, into uh, disease history, health history. Um, and there's going to be a whole lot more. We're at present seeing only the tip of the iceberg of what paleogenomicists are going to do and the tip of other icebergs with uh, respect to what archeologists are doing with some new techniques. One that I highlighted in that address is called LIDAR which is uh, a few years old now, and its particular virtue is it uses uh, laser pulses to allow you, so to speak, to see beneath the forest canopy features of the Earth's surface. So in heavily forested areas, which are hard for archaeologists to operate in, it's now possible to do survey archaeology, in effect, uh, on the cheap. And this has had a revolutionary impact on Maya studies in Central America and a pretty significant impact on Southeast Asian uh, history and archeology. span And again, it's just the tip of the iceberg. So inspired by these and a few other similar kinds of things, I make the argument that in future, the historical discipline is going to be much more um, 
varied in the lines of evidence on which historians rely. It's going to be very demanding because who can be a master of historical linguistics and paleogenomics as well as textual analysis? It would take you 20 years to get a PhD if all that was expected of you. So this is a future that in many respects is problematic as well as exciting. And I tried to explore that. And, and just to continue that for a second, John, how do you see the preparation of historians as we go forward? How do you imagine graduate education, the PhD programs in history unfolding as we move forward? I would guess, firstly, that they're going to be on the conservative side and a little bit behind the curve, the cutting edge of uh, research, if my uh, prognostications are correct. And that's mainly because of uh, institutional inertia. Uh, I would love to see Georgetown get out ahead of the curve. Um, and it's actually an opportunity. Usually when new directions emerge, especially in graduate education, uh, it's places like Georgetown that are not actually at the tip top of the totem pole that are more willing to take chances and upset the apple cart. And we actually have the people on campus uh, who could uh, do this. But putting Georgetown's place in all this aside, I do think that uh, in the fullness of time, graduate education in history is going to become more multidisciplinary and more and more students are going to feel the attraction, not the necessity, but the attraction of educating themselves in these other kinds of techniques. Now, I should say that um, for some history graduate education, particularly in African history, this has been uh, afoot for some time because in African history prior to 1850, there is very little in the way of written documentation. So Africanist historians have been working with archaeologists and historical linguists uh, for some time. Um, but that's going to happen, I think, on a larger and larger scale for some provinces of the historical discipline. I, you know, for 20th century U.S. history, these kinds of lines of evidence are never going to be nearly as important as textual evidence. But for many other times and places, they will become increasingly important. And students who want to educate themselves as practicing historians in these areas, whether it's colonial Mexico or early modern Russia, what have you, uh, are going to find it increasingly rewarding to learn a little bit more about particularly the natural sciences that uh, can contribute to historical knowledge without trying to master them. That's too much for anybody to uh, shoulder, but to become sufficiently literate to be able to evaluate scholarship uh, in these fields and not have to take at face value uh, everything that is published. This, I think, is within the reach of uh, graduate students trying to educate themselves. And I, in fact, I already see it happening to some extent in the students that we're working with here at Georgetown. John, thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us and for your leadership at Georgetown. Let me ask you in closing, is there one message you'd like to share with our community as we begin this new semester? Yeah, well, we're already um, a couple weeks in. Uh, I'll say this, uh, in my role as a, a historian in general, um, this pandemic experience is um, difficult and for some people extremely difficult, but um, communities, individuals, humankind have gotten through a whole lot worse than this many times before. Um, so patience, uh, perseverance and um, kindness to one another and um, we will see better days. John, thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights with us today and for all of your important work as a scholar, as a teacher. It's wonderful to have this time with you. 
And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya. <laughs>